Hello everyone and welcome back to cryptography. In this video we will be discussing trust. So think back to the Diffie-Hellman key exchange in which we had Alice and Bob talking to each other in the public with Mallory watching, listening in, and they arrived at this shared secret that could then be used for uh, symmetric encryption, say AES, uh, and they did this completely out in the open even though Mallory was listening in. Now it turns out that there's a little bit of a problem to this scheme that maybe you thought about, maybe you didn't. And the issue has to do with what if Mallory is an active participant of this conversation? What if Mallory's not just listening, but Mallory has the capability of modifying or forwarding data? Like let's say Mallory is sitting directly in between Alice and Bob, not just in a listening sense, but in an active sense where Mallory can start manipulating those messages during the key exchange. Turns out this is a massive problem. And this is why it's a massive problem. The problem is that when Alice wants to talk to Bob, and if Alice must talk to Bob through Mallory, Mallory can go through and carry out this key exchange with Alice, and then also carry out a key exchange with Bob, and we could have two entirely separate key exchanges performed in which Mallory now knows the key for both, and since Mallory now knows the key for both, Mallory can take encrypted data from Alice, decrypt it, re-encrypt it with the key for Bob, and just sit here passively as a man in the middle, as this active participant in between the conversation, and this is exactly what we're trying to avoid, right? We didn't want Mallory being able to decrypt our messages. But if Mallory performs this key exchange, pretending to be Bob with Alice and pretending to be Alice with Bob, Mallory is able to get these keys and make it seem as though Alice and Bob think that they're securely talking to each other when in fact they are not. This is, this is no good. Now also think back to uh, RSA in which we used asymmetric encryption uh, where we had this public key and this private key and people could encrypt with the, pu the public key and decrypt with the private key. Well, it turns out we have the exact same problem. We have a public key. How do we get this public key out to the world? What if when Alice goes to tell Bob Alice's public key, Mallory says, no, wait a second, your public key isn't that, your public key is my public key. Mallory changes it out, changes it out to Mallory's own public key. And now when Bob goes to send some encrypted message to Alice, they're going to be encrypting it using Mallory's public key. And now Mallory can decrypt it and then re-encrypt it with Alice's uh, public key. And again, Mallory can be this man in the middle. It's just actively sitting in the middle, uh, decrypting and then re-encrypting in both cases, just completely able to watch all of the traffic. And this is a massive problem because ultimately we're back at the initial problem of at some point we've got to get a key transferred. Uh, even in the face of someone that might be maliciously um, changing out the public key that we're sending or changing out uh, or performing this Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We have this active participant that's being malicious between us. This is a problem and we need to be able to overcome this. Fortunately, there is a way to overcome it. And the problem or the solution to that problem comes down to trust. You have to think about who can you trust, right? We just said that Alice and Bob have this inability to trust each other because Mallory is potentially in the middle messing up their key exchange and we don't know whether or not Mallory did that and how can we trust Bob if potentially Mallory got in the way and we have this this whole trust crisis. It's a, it's a nightmare. Uh, well, we need to start our trust rooted somewhere. We need this root of trust. Now, there are various ways of achieving this root of trust. We can go back to the solution of uh, we can have Alice and Bob exchange public keys uh, through some secure communication channel, right? They could meet at each other's houses and exchange E values and N values for RSA and, you know, exchange these, these public keys. And in fact, that would certainly work. But we want to be able to have secure communications that don't require us to drive to each other's houses and transfer keys. We want to be able to do this entirely, entirely automatically over the internet 
uh, in this insanely public venue of the internet and be able to have trust that our key uh, was transferred. So you gotta root your trust somewhere. And whether you know it or not, you probably don't know it, but maybe you do know it, you're rooting your trust in your operating system. You trust your operating system. At some core level, if the operating system wanted to be malicious to you, and while you're exchanging data, uh, making, you know, write system calls or whatever, just sending data out over the network, you're kind of at the behest that your operating system isn't uh, being malicious towards you, isn't going through changing data, intercepting data, doing insane things to you. At some point, you, you got to trust someone. And you're likely, whether you know it or not, you're trusting your operating system. You're... It, in the case of Linux, right, we've got an open source code base. We can audit this code, code base, make sure that the code base isn't doing anything insane. Uh, we can do all sorts of various things to kind of bootstrap our trust. But at some point, we've got this root of trust. We trust someone. And it turns out that our operating system, if we assume that this is kind of our root of trust, trusts other people. Somehow our operating system has gone through and figured out who else can be trusted. And in this case, our operating system has decided that they trust this DigiCert company, they trust Google, they trust this Let's Encrypt organization. Somehow our operating system has done the work necessary to validate the identities of these groups and validate their public keys, let's say, to be 100% confident that I have their public keys this, they have the private key, right? We're, we know exactly what the corresponding key is to this person. Uh, there's no Mallory to get in the way because our operating system has been pre-installed with uh, these default certs, certificate, certificates that uh, contain these public keys. It's been installed with these default public keys and our operating system has validated very carefully, yes, these can be trusted, uh, and we go from there. So DigiCert, once we know that our operating system trusts DigiCert, well, DigiCert can say, okay, I've gone through and verified the public keys of Twitter and Facebook. I trust these people. I trust their keys. They have the keys. These are, in fact, the correct public keys. I assert that I trust them. And Let's Encrypt is a public service that allows uh, simple web applications to also uh, announce their public key to the world. And Pwn College, for example, uh, gets its certificate from Let's Encrypt. So we have this chain of trust. We have our operating system that we kind of root our trust in, has somehow discovered the public keys of these services, verify that they're correct, and then these services go on to verify the authenticity of the public keys of other services, and so on. With different guarantees on the level of trust. For example, the level of trust being that they're trusted enough to trust someone else versus just trusted themselves. Uh, and we are able to build up this network of trust once we have this root of trust. So how do we do this? How do we perform this all mathematically using all of our various cryptographic uh, primitives and mechanisms? Well, think back to hashing. So we have hashing, we have the ability to take some large blob of data, hash it into potentially a smaller blob of data. And these two blobs of data are kind of inseparably linked such that a small change to one results in a massive change to the other. And we can only do this one way. It only goes one way. We have this hash function. Well, what we can do is we can build up what's called a certificate. And what a certificate is, is a bunch of data bunch of potentially metadata as well as important data such as the key and the signer. So we have this name, right? We say, hey, this is Connor. They have this public key where their E exponent, their, their public key exponent is this, uh, their public uh, modulus is this, and root is going to verify their authenticity. We're saying that somehow, and we'll see how in a second, that root is going to say that this is in fact the correct public key. So we take this blob of data and we uh, hash it. We throw it through, let's say, the SHA-256 algorithm to hash this into its own blob of data. 
Okay, well now we use our next encryption or next uh, cryptographic primitive. And what we use is the ability to sign something. So we previously discussed within asymmetric encryption uh, that we have this capability of signing something. So if we have this root trusted authority, uh, they can go through and sign with their private key that hashed data. And what's gonna result is a signature, right? It's going to be, hey, the this person who we trust, this root data that we trust, uh, has signed this blob of data with their private key, kind of affirming, kind of signing, guaranteeing that this is in fact true. Guaranteeing that they hold the private key and that they assert this statement, right? That's kind of what a signature is. I hold the private key, I can prove to you I hold the private key, and I assert that this blob of data is, I'm willing to sign it. So they sign this blob of data, this hash of the certificate, and that produces the signature. Well, now we have our certificate, our, our well-formed certificate, in which we have this blob of data that gives us important information, such as our name, our signer, and our public key. And we have this signature where Root has affirmed to the world that they've seen this blob of data and been willing to raise it to, once hashed, raise it to the their private exponent, right? They've kind of asserted this statement, signing it with their, their private exponent. And now we can verify this certificate. We can, as some third party that receives this certificate and receives this signature, we can go through and hash the certificate for ourselves. There's nothing stopping us from hashing it for ourselves. There's no uh, prevention. It's not like we need some key to perform a hash. We can just perform the hash ourselves arrive at that hash. And then we can do a signature verify on the signature. And that is going to, if correctly signed, produce the same hash, right? Because it's the hash that we signed. So we can, on one hand, take the certificate data, hash it. And then on the other hand, perform a signature verify on that data by taking the signed hash that was raised to the private exponent, taking that signature and rising it to the public exponent. And we should arrive at the same hash. So once we can say, hey, these two things are equal, we know with this mathematical certainty guaranteed by this combination of cryptographic properties that, hey, Root said that this certificate's good to go. So we trust Root and we trust Root enough to figure out who they trust. And I'm willing to trust who Root trusts. And now we've kind of built up this web of this, this web, this uh, tree structure of trust. And we're able to say now with confidence, okay, Root said that this is their public key. Well, I trust Root, and so I trust that this is in fact their public key. And once I can pass around all of these certificates, um, I can root off of my root of trust. And now Alice and Bob can, without some secure communication, just based off of their root of trust, their respective root of trust, that they, they trust these same signers, these original people, uh, they can trust that in fact we are talking to the correct person, that we have correctly found the right public key.